said to them, stick together as one community, for Allah assists the community, and the shaitan goes after the individual who is isolated. We'll get to that insha'Allah ta'ala. As for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, we can only at the moment make dua for them and give charity as much as we can. But one beautiful thing is that there's great awareness that is happening now that didn't happen before. And I consider it, the scholars have said, this is another step to something else. As for people asking me when, 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 my brothers and sisters, victory and uh, back to the way that you are anticipating doesn't happen fast, my brothers and sisters. That's a reaction, an emotional reaction, which is full of pain, and rightly so. But the path is long. The path is long, brothers and sisters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes the nation, the ummah, out of communities. The communities are made out of families. The families are made out of individuals. Each individual has a role to, pr to play. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists us when we are collecting. When we are collective, when we are collective in our hearts and in our interactions and our practices, not every single one, but the majority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give a people something, entrust them with something collectively if He knows that they are not ready for it, because they will corrupt quickly. And that is exactly what Umar ibn Khattab anhu said to his companions when they uh, entered Jerusalem. It's the same thing that Abu Darda said near Constant Constantinople or near Cyprus. It's exactly the same thing any Muslim leader or prophet or companion said to their people. We'll go through that insha'Allah ta'ala. But my brothers and sisters, please let's pay attention insha'Allah. It's a very important uh, lesson today. As for those who we assume by the will of Allah that they are martyred, everybody depending on their intention. But what we have seen of the people of Gaza, it's very hard not to believe that they are, insha'Allah, among the believers and the martyrs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. This is to our brothers and sisters. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says in Surah Ali Imran verse 169 Think not of those slain in the way of Allah as dead. Indeed they are living and with their Lord they have their sustenance. Rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them out of His bounty. Jubilant, meaning they're rejoicing. That neither fear nor grief shall come upon the believers left behind in the world who have not yet joined them. Meaning the people who have passed away in this way when they see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for them and how He's looking after them. They call out, don't be afraid. It's really, it's really good down here. It's really good on the other side. They rejoice at the favors and bounties of Allah and at the awareness that Allah will not cause the reward of the believers to be lost. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says about the people at the time of the Prophet sallallahu when they heard about the enemies in Quraysh, they were making up a plot. It was a fake threat that they were going to kill the Muslims in Medina only to make them scared. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the verse, 
الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل Allah says when people said to them behold a host has gathered around you and you should fear them it only increased them in faith and they answered Allah is sufficient for us and what an excellent guardian he is brothers and sisters in life or death the Muslim and the mu'min rejoices and I have seen many social media uh, non-muslim people that I haven't seen before saying how they are so astonished at the way at the way the Palestinians in Gaza are receiving this calamity one thing they said have you noticed that not one of them has said a single bad word against the Israelis not one of them is using that language yet they're the ones who are being killed but all they're saying is to Allah belong and to him we will return Allah is sufficient for us they're all saying you know saying the shahada these people are flabbergasted by what they're doing and perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening another door which we haven't seen yet in a plan for something else in the future the road is long brothers and sisters this is only a small pathway a small step for a lot of us this new generation you haven't seen stuff like this before and I understand in my age this is in my father's age in my age people who are my age we've heard this and seen this a lot but of course now because of social media we're seeing it really close as if it's at home but there are doors opening and remember no injustice stays the way it is for very long 100 years even 200 years is not very long when you look at history and in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, within 50 years, Umar ibn al-Khattab is entering Jerusalem. And by the time Ali anhu came along, the Muslims had reached China. So let's look at why they did that and how Allah gave them that victory. Brothers and sisters, in my last lecture, I spoke about Bani Israel, the children of Israel. And I focused on one message. And when I give a talk, really, it's a message that I'm focusing on, not the little things. Some people like to argue by splitting hairs. It's not 100, it's 50. It's not this long, it's that long. No, the message is the important thing. And the message that we were giving is the message of oppression, injustice, and corruption. And that the fight for the state of Israel among today's Jews, not all Jews, there are some good Jews, brothers and sisters, some good Christians, and there are even some bad Muslims. So the people who do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them. That not all Jews, but the Jews of today in Israel, that their desire for an Israeli state is grounded in a claim of an ethno-religious right. Ethno-religious right based on ethnicity and religion, to Jerusalem and Palestine, namely the Israeli state, through a movement called Zionism, which originally simply meant, originally, before 1948, which is the Balfour Declaration, when, is, when there was an Israeli, Israeli state, it was, the word Zionism, there was a philosophy to it, and it just simply meant a homeland for the Jews by returning to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, which was then always known to everybody as Palestine. They also called it Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. And there is Mount Zion. Mount Zion is Masjid al-Quds, which we call Masjid al-Quds. It's the, they also call it the Temple Mount. And it's got the, the one you see with the fences all around it. You see it? It's got the Golden Dome. And it's got the Masjid al-Aqsa at the front, a few other buildings. All of that, that whole thing, a little bit outside of it, that's called Masjid al-Aqsa, or Al-Quds, the holy masjid, the sacred masjid. It's not just one building. It's not a building. It's a whole place. That's called Masjid al-Aqsa, Al-Quds. It's also called Zion. In fact, the whole of Palestine is considered Zion to them as well. Anyway, 
uh, Zion basically means the land of peace, or Jerusalem means the land of peace in Hebrew. But it turned into an oppressive and violent form of occupation, which is forbidden in the spiritual meaning of the teachings in their own Bible and in their religion. They, their religion doesn't teach this, the oppression and corruption, such as in the books of, and I didn't mention them last time, they're called the books of Zams, the Zams, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. These are all in what the Christians call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and uh, they, were, they were called not to corrupt and not to oppress. The Bible of the Christians also says, don't corrupt, don't oppress. The Qur'an says the same thing, do not corrupt, do not oppress. Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about three positive actions that we must do. That is the foundation of our entire belief. After the salat, after the zakat, after the hajj, all these were very strong in them. But these three... Allah mentioned them for us always to remember. Allah commands you. And Khatib on Friday always says these words at the end of the khutbah. Allah commands you. Allah commands, not you, He commands everybody. Inna Allah yamru, Allah commands. Justice. Justice and equality. Wal ihsan. And He commands goodness unto others. Wa ita'i dhil qurba. And to be dutiful and good, especially to the relatives and family. The family union, the family circle is extremely important. Allah made it a foundation for victory. <laughs> Negatively, he tells us to stay away from. So this is the positive go forward and three things to stay away from. In the exact opposite. Meaning one gives you victory and success, the other one corrupts it and destroys you. What is it? And he forbids you from doing things that are shameful and disgusting, immoral things. munkar, anything meaning injustice and things that people universally reject, any person, such as taking the life of a person, their property, all that stuff. Walbaghi, walbaghi means to transgress your rights for the purpose of gaining i transgress i cheat i betray i falsify i lie i forge in order to gain something that's not mine do you see this is this is the foundation of success and victory brothers and sisters and any nation in the history of mankind who did not do these three positive actions and stay away from these three negative actions were destroyed eventually Naturally, they get destroyed. Even the Muslim communities. And that's possibly why many, many scholars say this is why the Khilafah, the final Khilafah, which was with the Ottoman Empire, not to speak about the Ottomans, but that's, they say that's why eventually the Muslims kept going backwards in their corruption until finally they fell. It took a very long time. But inshallah, it will come again. Because Allah says, in uttum udna, If you return, we will return to your victory. Brothers and sisters, you know, with, we mentioned the, the Jews a little bit in Zion because we're talking about Jerusalem. And I found something interesting. Uh, the great physicist, you know, Albert Einstein. Have you heard of him? Albert Einstein was a Jew. He was a very practicing Jew, very believing Jew. And he supported the new movement of Zionism. Now, before you judge it, let's have a look. So he was a Jew who initially was a strong supporter of Zionism before the Israeli independence in 1948, but then changed his stance after 1948. Why? Originally, Zionism just meant to establish a homeland for the Jews by returning to the Holy Land, Palestine. But after 1948, it took on a totally different meaning till this day, the establishment of a Jewish state. That's not what Zionism originally meant. And Zion is another name for Jerusalem, as I said. And Mount Zion is the Temple Mount. Muslims call it Masjid al-Aqsa. And there are several types of Zionism. There's political Zionism, there's cultural Zionism, religious Zionism, labor, labor Zionism, um, revisionist Zionism, and even Christian Zionism, all of them. 
And Einstein had interpreted pre-1948 of Zionism in the spirit of the Hebrew prophets who advocated for love between people and piety towards God, a Hebrew word called ch uh, um, chassad. And this is a guy who is actually from them, who knows the scripture of the Hebrew Bible and said, should we be unable to find a way to honest cooperation and honest pacts with the Arabs, then we have learned absolutely nothing from our 2,000 years of suffering and will deserve our fate. To the Zionist leader, uh, Wiseman, in 1929. And by 1948, that same year, in a speech given to the National Labor Committee for Palestine in New York City, he explained his fear of what a Zionist state would mean for the Jewish soul after seeing what he had, it had become as if feeling betrayed of what he believed. He said, apart from the practical consideration, my awareness of the essential nature of Judaism resists the idea of a Jewish state with borders, an army, and a measure of temporal power, no matter how modest. I am afraid of the inner damage Judaism will sustain, especially from the development of a narrow nationalism within our own ranks against which we have already had a fight without a Jewish state. We are no longer the Jews of the Maccabi period, a long time ago, a return to a nation in the political sense of the word would be equivalent to turning away from the spiritualization of our community, which we owe to the genius of our prophets. And a few months before his death, he was offered uh, to become the president of uh, Israel, and he refused because he said that, well, you guys corrupted, basically. He said, the, the important aspect of our Israeli policy must be our ever-present manifest desire to institute complete equality for the Arab citizens living in our midst, the attitude we adapt toward the Arab minority will provide the real test of our moral standards as a people. My brothers and sisters, this is a man I wanted to quote because I know this will go on YouTube. People will listen to it from all around the world, Muslims and non-Muslims. And I want to remind about the origin of even the Jewish faith to go to what Allah actually told them and not to go to made up things. Whether you are Jew, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever it is, it's all the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send a religion and a way of injustice. And He is the one who created all people from different nationalities, different ethnicities, different color. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He told us this. And the Prophet sallallahu last sermon was, He says, There is no privilege or uh, superiority of an Arab above a non-Arab except in piety and righteousness. Islam is not about ethnicity. Nor was any religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought. Yes, he brought different messengers to different people because just to, 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 to concentrate on different people and give them the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the entire world as we know. Rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy to all of mankind, regardless of what people say about lies about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Islam, there's no ethnicity that well, there is ethnicity, but Islam is not based on ethnic color, ethnicity or color or race or, or your gender, male or female, or where you're from at all. The most honored among you in Allah, to Allah is the one who is most righteous and God-fearing. And even then, Allah says, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Never praise yourselves in piety. Don't say, I'm most religious. I'm most pious. Allah is the one who knows who truly is more pious and righteous. That's called riya and pride, which destroys a person and destroys the community. Brothers and sisters, uh, so Zionism turned into an ultra-extremist uh, type of thing, and the first ever murder and attack on the Palestinians happened in what we call, what they called the Deir Yassin massacre of April 1948, just after they got Israeli, the Israeli state was established. And the Deir Yassin massacre was the first of a number of incidents in which Jewish fighters were involved in killing civilians in the War of Independence and after it was over. You should read about it. It was horrific. Horrific. Even Jewish articles are about it. Because as I told you, not all Jews accept this. And Einstein said about the Deir Yassin massacre, he said, It is inconceivable that those who oppose fascism, meaning the people who were behind it, they said, oh, fascism is wrong. He said, those who oppose fascism throughout the world, if correctly informed as to, his name was Mr. Begin, who led an extremist Zionist movement, 
Begin's political record and perspectives could add their names and support to the movement he presents. He does not want to present them. Einstein doesn't want to stand with them. Till today, brothers and sisters, the massacres, the illegal settlements and occupations, what many analysts have called ethnic cleansing, apartheid, and now in Gaza for 16 years straight, an illegal blockade and something they are doing to Gaza and the West Bank and other places in which there's something called international law has called illegal, illegal. And nearly every country member to the UN has said this is illegal, what they're doing. Something called collective punishment to the people of Gaza. And we have heard of incidents and people from inside of Israel and some writings from even their politicians, numerous ones of them before they got deleted, saying that we should kill their children because their children are going to grow up to become a threat to us. I don't know. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stop the plans and the plots of the makirin, of the evil ones. Let's now move on to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and compare how he entered Jerusalem and how the Muslims treated its inhabitants. Taking you back a little bit. Jerusalem, brothers and sisters, is holy to Muslims, Christians and Jews. In Hebrew, I told you before, it means the city of peace. And the Muslims also believe it's a city of peace. So do the Christians. Or the foundation of peace. In the Quran, Masjid al-Aqsa, the holy place. Before Muhammad وسلم, was called Baytul Maqdis, holy place. It is the second house of Allah on earth. And the Prophet وسلم, said in Bukhari and Muslim, when companions asked him, Ya Rasulullah, which is the first place of worship, masjid, that was built on earth? And he replied, the sacred masjid, meaning the Kaaba in Mecca. That was the first house of Allah built on earth. They asked him, Thumma ay, then which one? And he said, Masjid al-Aqsa, the farthest mosque. Farthest meaning further away from Mecca. They said, by how long, Ya Rasulullah, between the Kaaba and Masjid al-Aqsa? He said, 40 years later. 40 years between them. That's how sacred, subhanAllah, they are. And the Prophet ﷺ said, but wherever you reach, pray, for the entire earth is a place of worship. This is what Allah has made for the believers. Brothers and sisters, having said this, I'll take you back a step. Between 70 CE, common era, and 135 common era, Jews were expelled from a place called Judea in Palestine, the kingdom of Judea by the Roman Emperor Hadrian to the Middle East, to Europe, and to North Africa. They call it the diaspora. They were kicked out of their homes, they say. The point is they were dispersed throughout the earth. And the Emperor of Rome renamed Jerusalem to Ilia. Ilia. And for the next five hundred years for the next 500 years the Jews were unable to enter Jerusalem maybe there were fragments of one or two or some of them around but in general the Jews were out of Jerusalem for the next 500 years around 637 or 638 CE the Muslims took over Jerusalem how did they do that? The Prophet Sallallahu had told the Muslims and the companions that if you are able to reach a sham one day and you can pray even two rak'ahs in Masjid al-Aqsa, then pray in it. For it, is equal, for it is equal to such many prayers, maybe 500 or so, Allahu A'lam. And he said, the prayer in my Masjid al-Nabawi is four times more than Masjid al-Aqsa. And the one in Mecca is 100,000 prayers. In Masjid al-Nabawi, it's 1,000. So in the Masjid al-Aqsa, it's either equal to 250 prayers, and some scholars have said 500 salawat. Allahu alam the truth.
but it is the third holiest mosque. You all know it is the place where Muslims believe that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that the Prophet sallallahu was taken there on al-Buraq in night in the night journey and descended into the heavens. It is the place where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed Imam with all the prophets souls behind him. They prayed behind him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You all know the story of Isra al Ma'raj. In Jerusalem, in the Temple Mount, which the Jews call the Temple Mount, the Qubba al Sakhra, the Dome of the Rock, that is not the actual mosque that the Muslims pray in. Inside of it, you can Google it, it's got a rock that's not covered. And I want to tell you something about it. That is not a holy building, and it's not a mosque for the Muslims. Some narrations Muslims believe, it became famous, some believe that the Prophet ﷺ stood on the rock, under the dome of the rock, and from there, Jibreel ﷺ took him up into the heavens. But that, my dear brothers and sisters, is not an authentic narration. In fact, some scholars of hadith said it's fabricated. We don't know where the Prophet ﷺ actually ascended. It could be on the side, but somewhere in the Aqsa. So the rock itself doesn't, doesn't have any significance in Islam, and no companion ever made a significance to it. In fact, when Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu entered, he wanted to build a masjid on the Aqsa, what the Jews call the Temple Mount, up on top. Al-Haram al-Sharif, we call it. And he asked his companion named Ka'b al-Ahbar. Ka'b al-Ahbar was, had converted to Islam or reverted to Islam from Judaism. He was a scribe, a scholar. And he asked him, where should we build this masjid? He said, ya Rasul, in front of the rock or behind it? And Ka'b al-Ahbar said to him, build behind it. And he said, oh, ya Ka'b, you still have a little bit of the remnants of the, of the uh, testament of the Jews, and you have something about the rock still, because the rock is actually sacred to the Jews. They believe, they believe, that that's where Prophet Ibrahim salam laid his son to sacrifice, based on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they believe it was Ishaq rather than Ismail. So that rock is sacred to them. Until today, it's Jewish belief that that's the mainstream belief, that they're not, they shouldn't go and step on the Temple Mount because it's holy. And they believe that that is where Jacob spoke to God. Yaqub Aysam spoke to Allah somewhere there. So they fear to step on sacred land. That's why they don't enter, although they are allowed to enter it. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu built the masjid in front of the rock so that the Muslims don't venerate the rock in any way, shape or form. So who built the Dome of the Rock? He was a Khalifa in the 8th century or 9th century, 8th, 9th century, named Abd, Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan. He built it to, we don't know why, but some say it's in order to compete with the churches that were around. And some say he wanted, there was some political reason. Whatever it is, it's a beautiful mark. And till today we love seeing it. And it shows us that Muslims went in there at least as evidence. Now let's talk about what they did. We said that the Jews were forbidden from entering Jerusalem because the Romans had taken over a sham. A sham is greater Syria. Among it is Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, a bit of Jordan, a bit of Turkey. That's called a sham, greater Syria. Then it was called Transjordan. And Jerusalem and Palestine area and Masjid al-Aqsa was ruled by the Romans. And its commander or its emperor, its emperor was Heraclius. And inside of Palestine, there were indigenous people. There were the Palestinians. They didn't speak Arabic. They didn't speak Arabic. And they spoke another language, maybe Hebrew, Aramaic. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab entered it, cutting the story short, the commander and the Amin Hadihi al-Ummah, the guardian of this ummah, the Prophet ﷺ called him the famous companion Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, one of the ten promised paradise. He was the commander there. And he was waiting for Umar ibn al-Khattab to come. They placed a siege around Jerusalem, around the Aqsa. Why did they do a siege? Because the Muslims did not want any bloodshed in that area. It's too sacred. 
and they honored it. And so did the Christians that were living in there. They were Greek Orthodox Christians and some other denominations. And at that time, there was a patriarch. <clears throat> the patriarch's name was Patriarch Sophronius. The Muslims lay siege around it. Even though the Roman army was four times the size of the Muslim army. But you see, the Muslims, their heart, their iman, their unity together and their love for one another was unmatched throughout the world. The Romans used to want any companion of the Prophet ﷺ to marry, so if there was an emperor, to marry their daughter or someone important to marry their daughter because they believed that these companions made a huge deal, man. They were so famous that when the Romans ever captured... Uh, uh, captives from an army, a war, they would ask, is there a companion among you? Why? Because they wanted them to be part of their family. One emperor offered his daughter in marriage to one of the companions and he refused. Why? Because they want to take their genes, their genetics, because they thought they will pass it on to their generation. The companions were something else. So these people, they waited and they made a siege for about six months. Not one single fire happened. Not one single fight. Not a single blood was spilt. And Heraclius was too busy with other things and he had been defeated in many places by the Muslims. So now the inhabitants were there. They had an army, of course, Roman army, but they were the inhabitants, not the ones from Rome, the Byzantines. And what happened, there's this story, I don't know if it's true, that the patriarch said, we will give you this land and the key to Jerusalem on condition that your leader comes and takes the key off us. Because in our scriptures, it says what he looks like and only he will receive the key. He's a companion of Muhammad, son of Abdullah. I don't know if that is true. Allahu alam. I'm not going to quote it. But there was something special. He did say in all the history books, even the non-Muslim history books, they do say that the patriarch refused to give the key to the Muslims who laid siege until their leader, who was the companion of Muhammad, son of Abdullah, would come and he would only give the key to him. Now these people who laid inside of Jerusalem, they didn't say a word for six months and they were ready to die for Jerusalem. They were truly devout people of Christianity. Unfortunately, Within that little time, the Persians, before the Muslims came, before the Muslims came, the Persians had taken over Jerusalem from the Romans and they let the Jews come back in. Then the Romans came and took it back only 10 years later or so and they defeated the Persians and took back Jerusalem. This is before the Muslims came in. The reason why I want to mention this is because they massacred the Jewish population that was in Jerusalem after the Persians let them come in. Not only did they massacre them, they burnt them alive inside their buildings and on the Temple Mount. Subhanallah, the Crusaders. Well, later on they became the Crusaders, the Romans. The hate that they had between each other was tremendous. And that is probably why the Jews have this, this grudge still towards some of the Christians. I mean, you don't blame people in the past for the generation that is here today. But that's how it is. And it's true. They did persecute them tremendously. And they kicked them out, exiled them. No Jews in Jerusalem or Palestine. Maybe some here and there. When Umar ibn al-Khattab arrived, there is a story about him going on a donkey. I don't know if that's true. He came actually on a camel, a dab, or a, 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 a naqa. But he was wearing very simple clothing. Some say they had like 14 or 17 patches on it. Allahu alam if it's true. And that he had a servant with him, only both of them. And he was so just that on his way from Medina all the way to Jerusalem, he would tell his servant, we will exchange turns on the camel. Some say it was a donkey, but I think it was a camel. A donkey can't make it that far. And look, in history, even Muslims, they do add a lot of things just to make it a little bit sound nicer, but they're not really authentic. So I'm not going to say that this is authentic. We're just saying the story is there in Tariq al-Tabari. Al-Tabari is, is one of the references of history, but subhanAllah, it's got too much in there that's 
that's a bit fake and stuff. A more reliable one will be Bidayah and Nihaya by Ibn Kathir. Anyway, it says that, but, but the point of the message here was very just. I want to highlight this to you, brothers and sisters, that Allah gives victory to the people who are just and equitable. And he would let his servant sit on it a little bit, then he would sit on it, and then he would leave the camel to rest. So the camel also had to get its rest. And truly, Amr al-Khattab was very just. Until he reached there, it says that the servant ended up being on the camel because they were taking turns. And when he came off his camel, Umar al-Khattab took off his shoes. It was Fajr time and he was still outside of Jerusalem. He took off his shoes and he tied them with the, uh, the, the, the shoelaces and he put them on his shoulder. <laughs> you would see a person like a nomad doing that. And he came very humble and he led his camel towards Abu Ubaidah where the Muslims were waiting. Abu Ubaidah ran to him, radiallahu anhu, and he was wearing nice clothing. And he said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I can't let you enter Jerusalem and the people seeing you dressed like this and with your camel like that and your shoes on your shoulder. You have to impress the people. And Umar al Khattab said the famous statement to Abu Ubaidah, Ihin ya Abu Ubaidah, law kana min ghayrik. Ah, ya Abu Ubaidah. This is authentic. This is sahih in the uh, Bukhari and Muslims condition. So he said to him, Ya Abu Ubaidah, if only someone else other than you made that statement, I would expect from you a wiser man with more knowledge. He said, Inna kunna adhallu qawmin fa'a'azzana Allahu bil-Islam fa'mahma natlubu al-izzata bighayri ma a'azzana Allahu bihi adhallana Allah. Or another statement is, Nahnu qawmun a'azzana Allahu bil-Islam fa'in ibtaghayna al-izzata fi ghayrihi adhallana Allah. Oh Abu Ubaidah, we were a people who were disgraced before Islam came to us. Then Allah honored us with Islam and its guidance. So when we seek honor from anywhere other than it, Allah will bring us back to disgrace as we were before. Islam is not an ethnicity. People of all backgrounds enter into Islam. It's the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the patriarch Sophronius, he heard the Muslims say Allahu Akbar when Umar al-Khattab arrived. And Umar al-Khattab after Fajr, he gave them a khutbah. And in that khutbah, he gave him really important advice, about five or six very important advice. He says, fear Allah. Make Allah the only one to please. He advised them about their families. He advised them about their unity. He advised them about their humbleness. He advised them about their earnings of wealth and so on. These are the important things. The patriarch came out with the key. And he recognized Umar ibn al-Khattab as if he had seen him before or he was told about him. And he said, yes, O people, he is the man. So he handed over the key to Umar ibn al-Khattab and invited him inside. The famous, most peaceful conquest. When Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu entered, he made an agreement, a treaty with its inhabitants, the patriarch and the rest of the people. And he said to them, you have agreed to a treaty with us and an agreement, and we will honor it. A treaty of peace. Now listen to what this treaty was like. I'm just going to read the minimum because it's been added a lot over time. He said, in the name of God, it's called the Umar co uh, Treaty, or the, co the, uh, the, the, the Covenant of Umar, with the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Sophronius 638. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of Allah, Umar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Jerusalem. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be touched or destroyed. Neither they, nor the land on which they stand, nor their cross, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly confer converted, because in Islam it's forbidden to convert people forcibly to Islam. No Jew will live, oh, sorry, this, okay, this part I wanted to say, he said no Jew will live with, with them in Jerusalem. This part, brothers and sisters, is fabricated. This is, there's no authenticity to this statement. This was made up. In fact, this is a very important point I want to highlight. Umar radiallahu anhu 
called the Jews to come back from exile back into Palestine and also into Jerusalem. They returned back. They were allowed to worship. They were allowed to pray. They were allowed to go into their synagogues. He kept their synagogues. And the same rights that he gave to the Christians, he also gave to the Jews. And it is nothing hidden that even in the books of history of non-Muslims, they will tell you that the Jews during that time used to make prayers to God in their synagogues for Amir al-Mu'minin, for Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, because he allowed them to come back and exercise their freedom. Of course, in the treaty, he said to them, they will, the people of Jerusalem must pay the taxes like the people of other cities and must, and must expel the Byzantines and the robbers. There were people who were causing havoc, those who killed the Jews and so on. He said, you must expel them. Only the inhabitants have a right to it. Those are the people of Jerusalem who want to leave with the Byzantines, take their property and abandon their churches and crosses will be safe until they reach their place of refuge. The villagers may remain in the city if they wish, but must pay taxes like the citizens. Those who wish may go with the Byzantines and those who wish may return to their families. Nothing is to be taken from them before their harvest is reaped. If they pay their jizya, the taxes, according to their obligations, then the conditions laid out in this letter are under the covenant of God, are the responsibility of his prophet, of the caliphs, and of the faithful. Now you might be asking, what is this jizya? The jizya is a tax in exchange for all the services the Muslims gave them, also to protect them. And they were not forced or obliged or asked to join the army in any of their fights. The jizya was a very small tax that they paid that is only for those who could afford it. And even in the Ottoman Empire, when it came, for the Ottoman Empire for more than 800 years, they loosened this tax. And many of the Jews and Christians didn't even pay it. And only those who could afford it. So it's a very loose thing just to ensure that something in exchange for your protection and for our services that we give. The Muslims, they didn't pay jizya, they paid zakah, which is a more honorable form that we believe in. You can't impose it on non-Muslims. The key, the key... As there was a special key to a church of theirs, which was called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Since the arrival of Islam in Jerusalem in the 7th century, brothers and sisters, the Muslim family of the ancestor, the great Sahabiyyah, the companion Nusayba, Nusayba, who fought with the Prophet ﷺ in battle of Uhud, عنها, her family has held the keys of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre since that day till today. Till today. And uh, Christianity's holy site, alongside another family called the uh, Judah family, who were added to the original arrangements in the time of Salah ad-Din, the Muslim conqueror who seized the holy city from the Crusades in 1187. It's another story. And this key is still with them till today, brothers and sisters, guarding the holy, the church of the holy sepulchre. The, the story of this church goes like this. After the treaty was made and Umar al-Khattab announced it, it was uh, Zuhur time. And he said, my time of prayer came. And then the patriarch said to him, we offer you the holy church of sepulchre to, the church of holy sepulchre to pray in there. And Umar al Khattab refused. Why did he refuse? It is not haram to pray in a church or even in a synagogue, brothers and sisters. Just don't face the statues. But the reason why he refused is because this is what he said to him. He said to him, O patriarch, the reason I refuse to pray in your church is because I don't want the Muslims after me to, to uh, convert your church into a mosque and they will call it the mosque of Umar after this treaty that we have made. So show me another place to pray. And he took him to the Quds, which the Jews call the Temple Mount, that area on top. And there he prayed in front of the rock, uh, somewhere there, and, or maybe it was near it, I'm not sure. And truly, where he prayed today, the Muslims built a mosque which lasted till today, exactly where he prayed, and they called it the, church, the mosque of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Imagine he had prayed in the church. He was right. Because Umar al-Khattab knows the mindset of people that will come later. As they ease up on their deen and everything like that, he, got, he feared that some of them may break the treaty. So subhanAllah, this is what he did. Radiallahu anhu. Then he asked the patriarch to take him up to the holy place on the hill. And he asked him where the holy state was. It was full of garbage because the Christians don't have any significance to that place. Only the Jews and Muslims. 
And they cleaned it up and they cleaned the, the, the everything. And then he went forward and built a small masjid out of wood. A very small masjid out of wood. You might think, how small is it? It fit, it fit about 3,000 people. But it's, it's pretty small, but out of wood. And uh, later on, it became masjid. or uh, uh, It has a special name. It's not called Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's called Qibla of something. I forgot its name. It has a different name. Because Masjid Al-Aqsa, what did I say it is? The entire complex, that wall. And the Muslims actually built that wall around it. There is still one wall on the west side, right at the bottom, which the Jews believe, and probably it's true, that it is still the last piece of wall from the second temple of Solomon, which the Romans destroyed, and it's the only one left. And that's where they go to worship and pray. You see them nodding backwards and forwards, and they put little letters inside of it with prayers and stuff like that. So there were two temples of Solomon. It was destroyed. And the Jews believe that there's uh, something called the, um, the Messianic Age, which also the Christians call, where they're going to build the third Solomon, uh, temple of Solomon. But when? When the Messiah, their Messiah, the awaited one or the chosen one, comes back. They say it's in the year 6000. The year 6000 is in their calendar, which is in around 2240 CE. We're now in 2024. And that's what their scriptures say, but we believe in the Quran and we believe in what the Prophet ﷺ said. We don't believe in their scriptures because we believe they have been altered and corrupted over time, even though they still have uh, pieces of the Torah and so on, and they have the Tanakh. And we're not going to go into detail about that one, but they still have some remnants of it. However, we believe that it has been altered and played around with. So, brothers and sisters, that is the story of Amr al-Khattab who entering Jerusalem. And he went back to Medina, and then, subhanAllah, he was assassinated, as you know, while he was praying in the masjid. The Muslims continued looking after the Christians and the Jews for the next, what, 400 years until the Romans came back. It's called the Crusades. It's a long story. In the, year, in the 12th century, and they took it again. And again, they massacred and burnt and tortured the Jews that were there and tried to exile them again. But then Allah sent another warrior, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. But as the Muslims got weak, you see, and they left fighting and then they got stuck to the worldly materials and they started to divide and they started to fight over power and money. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought another calamity for them. And so Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was rose and led the army back into what you would call jihad. means to strive and struggle for good and protection and so on. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And regained Jerusalem and again, again Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, without going into too much detail, even the Christians, they write about him heroically and amazingly because his story is very hard to uh, deny. And he was extremely just and kind to the Christians after what they did to the Muslims. It's a long story. And he called the Jews to come back and live in Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem, Palestine once again. I want you to imagine, brothers and sisters, this. You're at Jerusalem. You see, you're a Muslim. You've prayed in Masjid Al-Aqsa. You're coming out on a Friday, for example, on a Jumu'ah. And as you're coming, you see some Jews in their traditional clothing, going towards the west, western wall, and they're praying. And you see some Christians coming to pray in their churches. Each one is nodding to the other in respect and replying the greeting with absolute respect. Everybody having freedom of religion, in peace and tranquility, living in harmony together. That was the state that the Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived in Jerusalem and Palestine after Umar al-Khattab entered it for the next 400 years. Then it was broken apart by the Crusaders. Then Salah al-Din al by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Muslims regained it. And then for the next, uh, what, 800, uh, uh, next, uh, how long? Until the fall of the Ottoman Empire. 600, 700, 800 years. The Ottoman Empire fell in the year 19, what was it? 1917, 1920, 24, 1924. And even at the time of the Ottoman Empire, how they treated the Jews and the Christians, the rights they gave them, there were reports that some of them even reached into political power. They gave them positions with, uh, with the government. 
and they were allowed to acquire their land. And the beautiful thing is that Islam, the Muslims, never took any of the land off them. They never occupied their homes. They never settled in their homes. They never took over any of their property that was theirs. But they lived in other places. All they did was manage it. All they did was manage it and make sure they were protected for that long. No other people in the history of Palestine and Jerusalem, foreign people that came in, ever did that. Except maybe the Persians at one stage, uh, 2,000 years ago or so, and again, uh, in, the, uh, in the 7th century, a little bit kindness to the Jews, but only lasted a little bit. But the Muslims, the Muslims did much more, much more for them, and they know it. Uh, I've heard many of their rabbis, you know, sensible, peaceful rabbis, you know, you can watch them on YouTube, subhanAllah. Very, you can, you can see uh, goodness in them and faith. And they speak, they say, we used to live with the Muslims and Christians with peace, tranquility. We were almost like brothers and sisters. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, brothers and sisters. This is what we want. We want justice and peace. We want ceasefire. We want them to stop their atrocities. Okay. Okay, you're taking your revenge, O Israel. How many do you still want to kill? Isn't it enough? You lost 1,000 something, you said. But you've already killed 1,000 something. How many? Now, we said it before, 5,400 now. 16,000 injured. How, how, many do you, how much revenge do you want? How much transgression? And even after 16 years of blocking them, how long? As Allah says, if they take hold of you, they will not have mercy nor honor any contract, Allah says. Except a few of them. Those who hold on to their Torah and the Hebrew Bible properly. It doesn't tell them to do this. But this is an extremist sect, extremist sect of Zionism that developed over time, which Einstein bared witness and said, I'm not part of this. And many, many other Jews. So, brothers and sisters, I want to emphasize Muslims are not taught to hate Jews, Muslims are not taught to hate Christians, Muslims are not taught to hate Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs or atheists. What we are taught in the Qur'an is to hate the belief, the belief that is against Allah, the belief, the faith, not the person. A person can revert to Islam and within one second he's our brother and sister. We don't like that Allah is called, you know, the father of a son. We don't accept the idea that Allah subhanahu wa that the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is not his last Prophet, or that Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, the Messiah, son of Mary, is not Allah's messenger. We don't accept that, 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 that you don't believe in Allah's words in the Quran. No, you have to live in all the scriptures. Other than that, we can live in harmony. Absolute harmony. A Muslim can marry from among the Jews and Christians. Obviously, the, the men can marry among the women of Jews and Christians. That's, that's another topic. But if you marry someone, you're going to love them. So you're going to love a Jew and a Christian. You're going to raise the, your children with them. But at the same time, a Muslim does not accept oppression and attacks and injustice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admit the children, the women and the men who have been killed mercilessly in Gaza into his, into his community of righteous and the people of the highest with him, al-illiyin, and with the prophets and the martyrs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change their state into goodness and peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and defend them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return the Muslims back to their deen together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite our hearts. Brothers and sisters, it is the values and the morals and even creativity that we have abandoned and held on to a lot of the Muslims, power, money, struggle of competition. I'll just finish it with this. Look at a typical family. One typical family among the Muslims. Look at the relatives among Muslims. Look at us as brothers and sisters. And I'm not just talking about praying in the masjid. That's a good thing, of course. 
Allah says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ As a matter of fact, prayer, salat, prevents from immoral behavior and from sinful acts and injustice. The point of the prayer is for that. Why isn't the prayer preventing from that? You look, something's wrong with the Muslim Ummah. Something's wrong. Something is wrong. And it is a long journey, but it's not very long, inshallah. If not this generation, the next. If not the next, then the next, inshallah ta'ala. And victory is not about taking a land. That we all take Jerusalem and we now, I mean, maybe Allah knows. In His wisdom, why not now? Maybe. Maybe the next day we'll stand up and kill each other. Allahu A'lam. Maybe there's someone else behind the line doing something else. You know, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and I ended with this hadith. He says, I asked Allah for three things. He gave me two and denied me the third. The hadith is in Muslim and Bukhari. He said, I asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala not to annihilate and destroy or get rid of uh, my ummah because of a common plague. A plague that will wipe him out. Allah gave me it. And I asked Allah that he doesn't wipe him out from an enemy, a foreign enemy. He gave me that. And I asked Allah not to let them wipe out, get wiped out because of enmity within their ranks. But Allah did not grant me that. Aduwan min anfusihim, from within them. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows a secret we don't. Your duty and your duty and my duty and your duty and your duty start with yourself. Next with your family. Next with your contracts and agreements. Who you work for, the jobs that you do. Next your wealth. Where do you get it from and how, how do you earn it and what do you spend it on? Most importantly your heart. Is your salat affecting you to be honest and trustworthy? Or are you still a liar and a betrayer and a cheater? What is your state with your husband and wife? What is your state with your children? How are you raising them? What is your state in your job, in your whatever you do? Are you learning? Are you educating yourself? Are you growing? Are you sticking to the values? I know it might not seem like a lot when I said that the car's blocked all the way, but it, it, you know, it, it says a lot. You know, <laughs> Rasul Sallallahu said, don't block the road and, and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is, I know it's trivial, but it says something about us. Alhamdulillah, there is still great hope and the ummah never dies. But it goes through a sleeping stage, which the historians say, the sleeping giant. Inshallah, next week, I want to talk about what the young people are always asking and talking about. It's really entertaining for them, but I want to bring it to reality and make it serious and think properly about it. The signs of the last hour... Is this one of the signs of the last hour? Is the Mahdi coming out? Is the Dajjal coming? Is Isa a.s. coming? All these stories that they're asking, inshallah, next week, I want to talk about it. And inshallah, talk from the Christian and Jewish angle as well of what they believe, inshallah ta'ala, and then what Muslims believe. Thank you for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa